Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate your uh, taking on the duties that you have done today. Thank you for leading us this morning and for doing the service this evening. Let's pray then as we come to look at this subject of God's word. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we praise you that you are a communicative speaking God. And we pray as we think about your word and as we look into it this morning that your Holy Spirit would stir in us that conviction that the end of the article number two talks about, bearing witness with our spirit of the truth and dependability of your word. Please stir in us uh, a knowledge of the truth and how rock solid it is and how we must pay attention to it and devote our lives to it and therefore to you. So speak to us powerfully this morning. The speaking God speaking to us, your creatures, your people. Amen. So we're going through our 15 articles of faith. If you weren't here last week, then maybe you're wondering what's going on. Um, As a uh, a church, we're part of um, a group of churches called the Counties of Huntington's Connection, which it um, declares on the blue notice board outside. And, uh, And I thought it would be good for us as a church to look at the 15 articles of faith, which are the, the sort of um, the DNA of, of, the, of the connectional churches. Um, there are 15 articles, and if you wanted to look at them, there's, there's a, a, um, a pile of bo- uh, yellow-greeny books in the um, table in the, in the foyer there. And at the back of there, you can see the articles um, and uh, look, at, look ahead if you want to to see what's coming next. They go right back, uh, as we thought last week, if you were here, they go right back to 1783 when the the connection formed uh, in the days of the Countess of Huntingdon herself, and so that they've been the basis of faith throughout those years. And so you will find the language a bit archaic. Uh, it is the language of 18, uh, sorry, 1783, so don't expect it to be quite what we, uh, the way we talk nowadays. I have slightly tweaked it to get rid of one or two Fs and things, things like that, just to make it a, a bit easier for us. Um, the reason we're doing this at this time is that as a church, we're, we're moving towards becoming a, a registered charity. And at the end of our constitution um, uh, as a registered charity, w- w- oh, well, not that we are yet, but at the end of our proposed constitution document, are the 15 articles. And that's really the good bit of the document. All the rest is sort of formulated by lawyers, you know, boring legalities and technicalities and how to run a church. But the really good stuff, what we really hold dear to, is at the end in the 15 articles. So I thought it would be good for us to examine them. Do we really believe this stuff? Do we understand this stuff? Uh, And look at it together. So that's what we're doing. So then let's look at number two. Thanks, Gemma. Article number two. Let me just read it again to you of the scriptures that it pleased God at sundry which means various at sundry times and in diverse that means various too in diverse manners to declare his will and that the same should be committed to writing which is therefore called the holy scriptures which contains all things necessary to salvation its authority does not depend on the testimony of man but wholly upon God its author And our assurance of its infallible truth is from the inward work of the Holy Ghost, bearing witness with the word in our hearts. Now, if you were here last week uh, for article number one of God, the article um, summarising our our beliefs about God from the Bible, then um, then you'll remember that curious statement that we looked at last week, which is that God is without body parts or passions. And, uh, and probably that's a bit that made your head scratch in last week. If you want to know what, 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 what that was all about, well, I refer you to listen to, again to last week's. The without passions bit, let me just briefly recap that, that bit. The without passions bit is an archaic way, a way of saying that God is not passive. He is not pushed around by anything. He is and he does his good pleasure. He acts freely according to his own good pleasure. We might want to, we might try to, uh, but things inhibit us, they restrict us, they prevent us, they divert us, and all sorts of things. But God, no, he has none of that passivity, no pushing around. He doesn't get pushed around by anything. He he does his own will freely and sovereignly and completely without any inhibitions from outside of himself. And so, Article 2 begins with what God has done in his pleasure. What did it please God to do, freely and sovereignly? 
And it says it pleased God to declare his will and that it should be committed to writing. So the Holy Scriptures and the Bible is God's free sovereign act. It's what he chose to do according to his will. He wasn't forced into doing it. He wasn't coerced into doing it. He just freely did it of himself. It's a free act of God. His initiative, his pleasure to do so. Now that, the starters, highlights two things at least. First of all, God is communicative. He is of his nature communicative. He's he's a speaking God. And secondly, it, it, it highlights this, that God is not indifferent to the words of the Bible. They're not some take it or leave it thing, uh, the way, you know, that may be for, for, for many books for us, you know, I quite enjoy that one, no, I didn't enjoy that one. No, for God, this is what he wrote, and this is very precious to him. This is his will, it was his will to have uh, us have it, and have, it, have us have it in written form. It's in God's very nature, it's in God's very unchanging nature, his good pleasure to reveal his mind and will. And so he's not indifferent to the words that are printed in front of you on your laps or in the little pouch in the Bibles there. They are his revelation of his mind according to his good pleasure. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us, at the very uh, least, it tells us that if we try to know God apart from this, then we're insulting him. If we try to know God apart from the words that he's given us from Genesis to Revelation, it's an insult to him. You can't pretend to be interested in God if you don't take this as seriously as he does. This is what he's been pleased to produce and give us. It's the revelation of his mind and will in written form and so we have to accept it as such. Let's just briefly think about the fact that God has a mind and a will. You can see that in the words there. It talks about the fact that God has a mind and this is the the declaration, sorry, that God has a will. This is the declaration of his will. Declare his will, it says. We sometimes jokingly say of an object, maybe a shopping trolley, it's got a mind of its own. What do we mean by that? We mean it it doesn't go where I want it to. I want to go straight and it just keeps wanting to go left and crash into the baked beans or whatever it is. We feel it resists us at particular points. Well, if it's not uh, irreverent, God also has a mind of his own. And this, of course, means that he's different from lifeless, mindless idols. We thought last week about the fact that God is different. He's the true and living God, as opposed to lifeless, um, uh, um, false gods. And And so God has a mind of his own. This is distinctive about him, the true God. Anything else we worship, any other gods, are man-made gods, and they're just like dolls in our hands, which, which do what we want them to. What does a doll do in a child's hands? It does exactly what the child wants it to, as the child plays with it. So it is with idols, any idols that we hold dear, anything that we worship instead of God. But the true and living God has a mind of his own, which is independent of our minds and will. That's unique about him. And so he's revealed his mind and his will in written form in the Bible in order to pull us, like that shopping trolley as it were, in order to pull us in a particular direction. Here's a test as to whether you worship the living God or a God of your own making. Does the God you worship ever pull you in a particular direction that you initially didn't set out to go in? If not, then your God is just an extension of your own mind. It's a puppet God in your hands, a Play-Doh God. But if you feel your God pull you, and particularly if you feel him doing so through the words of the Bible, then your God is the true and living God, the God who has a mind, the God who has a mind and a will, way above ours, in fact. So what is the mind and will of God? What is it he's pulling us towards? What is it he's given us that these words in written form in order to pull us towards? Well, it's time we opened it, isn't it? Let's open it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. I'll pick it up from verse 14, actually. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Paul writes this, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, 
knowing from whom you learnt it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for a proof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So the scriptures there are able to make us wise for salvation. Now that little word salvation has got a whole load of um, implications to it. What, What is that talking about? Well, we know from lots of other places in the Bible, but just very briefly, it implies that we are lost initially, that, uh, that we're lost of ourselves. A- as a race, we've, we've chosen to go astray. We've chosen to bring on ourselves death and destruction, Genesis chapter 3. We've chosen uh, to destroy ourselves. That's the direction that we've pulled ourselves in. But God has an independent will from us. And he has, he's pulling us in a different direction, which is the direction of salvation. We chose to die. He chose us to live. We chose to bring on ourselves destruction forever. He, though, like that shopping trolley that goes a different way and is actually irresistible, unlike the shopping trolley, he's going, no, I will have people that live forever. That's the direction he pulls in. This is the great good news of the Bible. This, this is the, just stuff that makes your heart sore. We chose to destroy ourselves. He chose to say, no, you will live That is my will, and I will make it happen. And so he's given us his word, which is able to make us wise for salvation. So we were foolish for destruction, but he's able to make us wise for salvation. So how does the Bible do that? Well, it hints at it here through faith in Christ Jesus at the end of verse 15. And uh, let me just move on to another Bible verse now. John chapter 5. John chapter 5 on how, how it is that anyone can come to salvation. Jesus here is talking to some Jews, talking to some people. And so these Jews, therefore, would have the first part of our Bible. They would have the Old Testament. They knew it. They revered it. They read it. They took it seriously, so they thought. And Jesus says to this to them, chapter, John chapter 5, verse 39, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, says Jesus. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now this is a really important verse. Now that's not to say that this is more important than any other verse in the Bible. But this is, if you like, a meta verse. This verse tells us how to deal with the whole Bible. How to treat the whole Bible. The Holy Scriptures give us the key to eternal life. But this, these couple of verses here, verses 39 and 40, they tell us that if we're unwilling to come to Jesus Christ for eternal life, then we may as well not bother with anything in the Bible. We've missed the whole point of it. These verses are crucial because they describe the whole of what God has given us in written form in the Bible, in the Old and New Testaments. It is all pointing to Jesus. If you want eternal life, the whole Bible will direct you to that and will will do so by directing you to Jesus Christ, to no other source. The Old Testament testifies to Christ in the form of promises and prophecies and foreshadowings and all sorts of different ways. The New Testament testifies to Christ in the narrative of Jesus' life and death and resurrection that we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And then the rest of the New Testament interprets those events for us and tells us what they mean. Do you remember the Bible study? Um, I I mention it relatively frequently. The Bible study that Jesus took his disciples on, two of his disciples, on the very day of his resurrection. Um, It's in Luke chapter 24. Turn there with me if you will. Just a few pages back. Luke 24. Here Jesus on the day of his resurrection takes his disciples, two of them, through a breathtaking Bible study. Luke 24, verses 25 to 27. And he, Jesus, said to them, O foolish ones, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things, crucifixion and so on, and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
So do you see there? All the scriptures declare to us the Lord Jesus Christ. And in particular, all the scriptures declare to us his death and resurrection, his suffering initially and then afterwards his glorification. And so this is the great subject of of what God wanted written in the Bible. Jesus, his son, crucified and resurrected. And it's because it's by trusting in Jesus crucified and resurrected that we can have salvation, that we can have this this hope, that we can have this eternal life that, that, that God has willed for us, God has chosen for us. And so if we want to be wise for salvation then we need to listen and believe in what the Bible tells us about Christ's death and resurrection in particular. Because all of it focuses in on those two things, that pair of events that happened at Easter. As Article 2 says, the Holy Scriptures contain all things necessary to salvation. And so thinking of that uh, with uh, Luke 24 in our minds, we see that the all things necessary for salvation are this... Well, it's this message of Christ crucified and resurrected. That's the message. That's, that, that's how we um, take hold of salvation. Those are the things necessary for salvation. It might seem crazy to some that, um, that the public execution of a man 2,000 years ago could have any, any good effect at all, any effect at all, apart from on himself. And yet the, the Bible insists that it didn't just have some effect for some people for some time, but it actually has effect for people for all time and eternally. And so therefore for us 2,000 years ago in a different part of the world, the Jesus Christ crucified affects us here today. That message that the Bible gives us will seem like foolishness to so many people, won't it? And God acknowledge, acknowledges that in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2. But that's to pull the rug rug from under our human pride. What God has given us in the scriptures is not something we can find here, there and everywhere. Uh, God has just given us in in a form because he wanted to give the same thing to us. No, God is giving us here a message that you will find nowhere else and frankly that will seem foolish to our human way of thinking, our human uh, way of thinking where we're so full of ourselves and think that we can achieve and, and save ourselves and, and redeem ourselves and, and, and sort ourselves out and look after our own future and so on. It pulls the rug from under our pride, from under our, our insistence and our human prowess. It's God's will to save us then by a way that it's to- totally counterintuitive, totally goes against the way we would naturally think. It's unguessable to the human mind this message of Christ crucified and resurrected being the way to salvation. It's unguessable, it's counterintuitive. And yet once you come to understand it and believe it, it is beautifully logical. So the only way we could come to this message, isn't it, is by God revealing it to us and doing so really clearly. And so God has done so. It is his will to save people through Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. And so he's made it really crystal clear. He's put it in black and white for us in a written form so we can keep coming back to it. And and, and go, is that really what it's... Let's just look again. Is that what it... Yes, it does say that. And see it again and and be reassured and and, and clarified and... and, uh, and develop a real conviction of the truth of this. God's message then to humanity, to the world, is that the deepest longing of the human heart is answered not from within ourselves, but from totally outside of ourselves. Not by us figuring it out for ourselves even, no. It's by God doing it all for us, handing it to us on a page, if I can put it like that. Handing it to us on a plate. The Bible's message of Christ crucified undermines all human confidence in our own prowess. It pulls the rug totally from under that and makes it topple over. And it says, no, there's no hope in you, no hope within the human race. No. You're full of sin, you're against God, you've chosen to destroy yourself. But there is hope, and it's found outside of yourself in Jesus Christ. So come to Christ and have your old life put to death by faith in his death. And begin a new life by faith in his resurrected life. It's a counterintuitive message. And this is the message of salvation that God willed to give us in written form. 
So it's God's people, uh, sorry, it's, it's God's will to save people. To pull people out of the rut of destruction that we've all sunk ourselves into, collectively as a human race. It's God's will to pull people out of that. To save people like you through, ch- through trusting in Jesus, crucified and resurrected. That's the good news of the Bible. It tears us down and it remakes us totally new. Well, there's so much I want to cram in. I think I'll have to content myself with just two more things. The first of my two things is that we must believe God's words. The second is that we can believe God's words. We must believe God's words first then. We must believe God's words. This comes in Article 2 on the screen there when it talks about Scripture's authority. Scripture speaks authoritatively to us. <clears throat> so God's words to us are the words of a king to his subjects. They're not suggestions, they're not take it or leave it. This is the words of a king to those he rules. We live in an an era, a culture that's deeply suspicious of any claim to speak authoritatively. And yet the Bible just does so. It just knocks that aside and says, well, I'm going to do so anyway. Consider the, there's a little phrase in the Bible that comes a lot in the Old Testament. Thus says the Lord. It's another maybe phrase that sounds archaic to us. Thus says the Lord. But there is huge amounts packed into that. It, in the culture of the ancient Near East, it was a claim to royalty. It was a claim to be the one in charge of the one being spoken to. And so let me just look at that little phrase. In 1 Kings chapter 20. Turn there, turn there with me if you will. 1 Kings 20. And it's really quite amusing to see how this phrase is used. Thus says the Lord. Or thus says someone else. As well. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 20. And just listen out for whenever it says thus says someone or other. Okay? 1 Kings 20, beginning verse 1. Ben Hadad, the king of Assyria, gathered all his army together. Thirty-two kings were with him and horses and chariots. And he went up and closed in on Samaria and fought against it. And he sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben Hadad. Your silver and your gold are mine. Your best wives and children also are mine. And the king of Israel answered, As you say, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that, you have, all that, I, all that I have. That's what Ben-Hadad said. Ben-Hadad proclaimed lordship over um, Ahab, king of Israel, and, he, and it worked, didn't it? It worked. Ben-Hadad grovels at his feet. Let's look at verse 13, same chapter. And behold, a prophet came near to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will give it into your hand this day, and you shall know that I am the Lord. The multitude is there, he's talking about Ben-Hadad and his Syrian army. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus says the Lord, by the servants of the governors of the districts. Then he said, Who shall begin the battle? He answered, You. A battle happens and we'll fast forward on to a second battle, verse 28. And a man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said the Lord is a a God of the hills, but but he's not a God of the valleys, therefore I will give this great multitude into your hand and you shall know that I am the Lord. And they encamped opposite one another seven days. Then on the seventh day the battle was joined and the people of Israel struck down the Syrians 100,000 foot soldiers in one day and the rest fled into the city of Aphek and the wall fell upon 20,000 men who were left. Ben-Hadad also fled and entered an inner chamber in the city and his servants said to him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let's put on sackcloth around our waists and ropes on our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare, spare your life. So they tied sackcloth around their waists and put ropes on their heads and went to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please let me live. Can you see the contrast, the things that are going on in this passage? Ben-Hadad initially proclaims, Thus says Ben-Hadad as he claims lordship over the king of Israel and and his silver and gold and his wives and his children. Thus says Ben-Hadad. But there's another voice, isn't there? Thus says the Lord. And he comes to Ahab's rescue. The Lord thunders in as Lord. And in the end, Ben-Hadad's way of speaking to Israel has become no longer thus says Ben-Hadad. No. 
He's now the clearly the one groveling, isn't he? And he just bleats. Your servant Ben Hadad says, "Please let me live." You can see this played out in a number of places in the Bible. Two people, well, two persons, if I can put it like that, saying, "Thus says so and so." You can see it. In, we looked at it a few weeks ago. Uh, the Rab Shaka in, in, in Isaiah chapter uh, 36 and 37, that commander of the Assyrian army, and he says, "Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria," but he loses. You see it in Pharaoh in, in, in Egypt. The slave taskmasters say, "Thus says Pharaoh," but he loses to the Lord. And so, when the Lord says, "Thus says the Lord," he is claiming lordship over the people he's speaking to. He's claiming lordship over us, the readers of the words he's caused to be written down. It is a claim of lordship. It is a claim of authority that he is lord and king in charge. And just think how this is changing the New Testament, the little formula, thus says the Lord. What does Jesus say? Does he say, say, thus says the Lord? No, he doesn't. He says, I say to you. You see how that authority has changed now. Well, what's changed? It means it's that the human speaker is claiming that authority for himself because he is the Lord's anointed. He is the Son of God in the flesh. And so it is right and proper. It would never have been right and proper for an Old Testament prophet to say, I say to you in that authoritative way, not Moses, not Jeremiah, not Isaiah, not any of them. But Jesus, yes, he's the Lord's anointed. He himself is king, the Lord's anointed king. It is right for him to claim that lordship over us. And he does so, as he says repeatedly, I say to you. So the Bible is God's authoritative word to the world. And Article 2 there says, Its authority does not depend on the testimony of man, but wholly upon God, its author. That's not to say there's any magic in this little phrase, thus says the Lord. If you want to read an, an entertaining chapter, well, a tragically entertaining chapter of the Bible about thus says the Lord, have a look at Jeremiah chapter 28 sometime later today and see how Hananiah tries to take those words, thus says the Lord, on his own lips. When God has not said him to, sent him to say anything, he tries to just assert that he is speaking God's words. And uh, it is tragic, you'll, but nonetheless, uh, it's very informative. So the Bible is God's authoritative word to the world. Let's just listen to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verses 19 to 21. He's just been talking about the fact that Peter, well, Peter's just been talking about the fact that he saw Jesus' glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. He heard the voice from heaven. He heard the Father speaking audibly in his ears. And then he says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, and we have something more sure. The prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So there, the words of scripture are not mere human words. Though they come to us through human prophets, through human, through human authors and apostles and so on, they are God's words. They're God's words. And what does that mean for how we treat the words of the Bible? Well, Peter tells us there, verse 19, you will do well to pay attention to them, to sit up and listen. This is God speaking here. As you read your Bible, this is God speaking. And so we must believe and obey the words of the Bible because they are the words of the God who is Lord, Lord of heaven and earth. Listen to this from Isaiah 66. Thus says the Lord, there we go again. He's claiming lordship over you and me. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. And this is the one to whom I will look, to the one who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Really key verse there for what it means to be under the authority of God's word. He is Lord. He's Lord of heaven and earth. And he's the one he looks to, the one, he, the one he's interested in, if you like, is the one who trembles at his word, who knows this is the word of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God himself. 
So we must believe and take seriously God's word. And the second thing, if I can just squeeze it in, we can believe God's words. God's words are utterly dependable and reliable like nothing else. Every day you trust in all sorts of things, don't you? We all do. You're trusting in your chair right now. I'm not. You trust that it's well made, that it it hasn't been abused and it's going to hold up for another ten minutes or so, however long. I don't know how long I'm going to be. You you trust it, don't you? We trust all sorts of things. We trust the cars we we travel in. Uh, We we trust a lift when we get into it, don't we? We trust that the the cord's not going to snap and so on. We trust people as well, don't we? We trust the people that fix our cars, the people that fix all, all sorts of stuff. We trust other drivers that they'll stay on the right side of the road and won't crash into us. Many times these things are fine and we live life and many times they're fine, but not always. Sometimes, even with the best will, these things let us down. God's words, though, are entirely reliable and dependable. Just think of God's, again, being without passions. He is unchangeable. Nothing can divert him. Nothing can throw him off course. Nothing can change what he decides to do. He is utterly reliable, utterly dependable, because he is. Sorry, his words are, because he is. Just a few verses. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will not do it? Has he spoken and will not fulfill it? So God's promises in in the scriptures are utterly reliable, dependable. Psalm 18, verse 30. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He's a shield for all who take refuge in him. So God's word promises salvation, eternal life. For those who humble themselves and tremble at his word and take him seriously and treat him as God and trust in the saviour that he sent into the world, Jesus crucified and resurrected. And for all who do so, that, that verse, that Psalm 18 verse 30 says that he's a refuge He's a shield, he's a protector, a provider. He's a father, he's a shepherd for all who humble themselves to his word, to his dependable, reliable word. And so for everyone that does submit their whole lives to God's word, God promises to carry you through all of life's pains and difficulties and heartaches and problems. Carry you through that. He promises to bring you safely through that future day of judgment that he'll bring us all to. And he promises beyond that that you'll have unadulterated joy in the world to come. The Bible promises all these things for those who believe what it says. God's word is utterly dependable, utterly reliable. As as Jesus himself said in John 10.35, Scripture cannot be broken. If God's words then are utterly dependable and reliable, I just want to ask you this question. Have you personally been holding back from putting your full weight onto God's words? God has spoken to us. We've thought about the fact they're authoritative. We've thought about the fact they're dependable. It's possible to know that abstractly, that something is reliable and dependable, but without putting your weight on it. Maybe you come to church week by week and you hear this good news of salvation through Jesus Christ said in various ways and you're happy to hear about that. But you go away, live a life just as normal every week and, and nothing ever changes. You haven't done anything about this. Well, if so, then you're like a person on a sinking ship to whom a lifeboat has been sent. You look at the lifeboat once a week and you admire it. You admire the paint on it. It's a majestic looking boat. It looks really solid and reliable. And you stay where you are on your sinking ship. You stay there because you prefer it. Your life's set up as you want it. You want to keep it that way. But it's going under. Salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. You cannot keep your life the way it is forever. So if you're trusting in this world for your happiness, then you're trusting in a sinking ship. There is a lifeboat, a saviour, sent out for you Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified and resurrected. And don't just look at him once a week. Don't just come to church, look at him occasionally and go, hmm, that looks interesting or good or whatever. And then spend most of your time gazing at the world and all the attractive things that there are there. As though that's better, as though that's going to give you happiness and, and life. Leave all of that and get on board the lifeboat. 
Don't just know about Christ's dependability. Don't just know about the, the reliability of God and his word. But put yourself personally. Stake yourself on that word and on Jesus Christ. Leave your life. Christ died to put an end to our old life of living for ourselves. And he rose again to give us a new life. An indestructible life. A life of glory and joy and fellowship with God. Friendship with God. Love. Being loved forever. Come and put your weight on the lifeboat that Jesus sent. If you never have. Take your gaze off the glamour of the world. Onto the words of God. Black and white. The words of the Bible. Genesis to Revelation. Submit to his authority. Believe his telling of history. And trust his promises. God has been pleased to declare his will to us. To commit it in writing. So that we keep coming back to it and understanding it more and more. It's by God's word that God brings people into salvation through Christ. And it's by God's word that he keeps people in salvation in Christ. And so this, this message of what we've been thinking about this morning. God's word, its authority, its dependability is for all of us whether we yet know Jesus Christ or not. This is the ground on which to stand. This is where there is life that God wills for humanity. He will save. The question is whether he will save you. It all depends on whether we trust and tremble at God's word. Let's pray together. We thank you, sovereign God, that it's been your free will to declare, your, to, to, to declare your will to us. You've done that freely and sovereignly. And your will is to save people, though we have chosen otherwise. It's to give people eternal life, though we've chosen for ourselves death and destruction. We marvel at the fact that your mind is independent of ours and has chosen for us the opposite of the disaster that we have chosen for ourselves. We praise you that you have made this good news known in our language. We praise you that Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected is a historical truth of huge significance for everyone who trusts in him. We praise you that this is solid ground, reliable and authoritative. We thank you, our King, for speaking to us. May we each treat your word for what it is, tremble at at, at it because we fear you. We know you are the great God. May we believe and stand firmly on your promises. May we not gaze at at everything else apart from your word. But may we keep coming back to it, knowing it and loving it and loving you, therefore, through it. Amen.